Good. How's it going? Good. It's so nice to see you. Um, thank you for touching on a lot of points that we are going to continue to touch on moving forward and, yeah. and really discuss um, in more detail, essentially. So I don't think we can start any conversation about the automotive industry today without discussing, you know, one of the biggest turning points that we see in our industry right now, and that's electrification. A lot of things that we've talked about in the past. And, you know, as people become more conscious of their environmental impact and a lot of focus is being pushed to sustainability. Um, 2021 is really being positioned as a true tipping point for the electric industry. So um, how are you really changing your approach to better reach individuals in that you know, electric or energy efficient mindset? And you know, how can marketers break through the clutter in a pivotal moment right now? Mm, no, great question. I think you know, I've, I've been asked this a lot, which is you know, why EV, why now? And I think it's a perfect, um, good, in a good way, a perfect storm of things coming together all at the same time. More awareness and more interest from, from consumers, right, about what they drive. COVID, I think really, as I mentioned earlier, has really changed, I think, the way people view personal transportation, um, the ways people interact with their vehicles has changed, right? We, we celebrate in our cars, we get from A to B in our cars, maybe it's a safe space in our car. Um, where you can, like I did, take conference calls at the beginning of COVID. So it's really changed, I think, the way we think about it. So that engagement, I think, coupled with better technology, um, accessible EV in terms of meeting at a uh, price point that people can, more people can afford. So we talk about it as not just for the millionaires, but for the millions. Um, and really, too, I think in, in, in terms of product development, we've seen this across the industry with more and more EVs now coming in body styles that everybody can somehow relate to. You know, in an SUV or compact car, um, something where you can see yourself in it. And I think that's one of the key things that we're positioned as now to kind of break through, which is, you know, we can talk about changing the world, which is wonderful and great. But if someone doesn't feel like it's going to change their world and they can see themselves in it, then um, it still doesn't quite resonate. And that's really how we positioned our view in terms of electrification and bringing EVs to market. We need to make it more accessible. We need to go kind of a little bit, uh, take a few steps back. Um, why should I choose an electric vehicle? Why could it be right for me? What about charging? What about the daily drive? Like, what does that look like? Yeah. And I think the great news now is more than ever, those things are much more accelerated in terms of their development than they have been in the past. Um, like I said, for those reasons that we talked about earlier, more attuned to climate change, people wanting to care more about what they drive. And I think they just have better options. So it's a... It's a good time to be in the industry. Such a good point. I think I read that there was going to be 30 new models from 21 different brands that are emerging over the next, you know, 11 to 12 months. So it's definitely going to be an interesting space. And, and that adoption, I think, is going to be really, really interesting to see. Because currently right now, you know, EVs are making up around 2% of U.S. sales. And a lot of brands mm -hmm. have much bigger and loftier goals. What do you see as the biggest hurdle to EV adoption moving forward for consumers? Hmm. Um, the same thing I would have said probably about five years ago, which is still infrastructure. Yeah. I think that I would have also included in that list product yeah. that you don't have product that's either um, affordable or attainable or relevant. I think that's not the case any longer. I think you'll see, like you said, a whole wide variety of different um, electric vehicle offerings coming in the pipeline or coming down the pipeline. Now it's really just kind of the infrastructure and charging in particular keep up with that. Um, and I think we'll, we've, we already have seen um, a lot more investment in infrastructure in the last, call it six to 12 months. I think that that is only going to accelerate. And if the more we can make this about uh, more parking spaces, more availability of charging, either at your home, your work, um, where you shop, where you spend your time, um, that's really going to be the key. And I think we've seen it on the coast. We've seen it in certain parts of the country that are just more EV ready. And I think now we're starting to see that slowly happening across the country. And we actually did a cross coast, um, uh, across the coast, I should say, um, coast to coast tour with the ID4 just to prove that point. So, you know, how far we can go across the country um, and how many days with charging. And the good news is we were able to find charging across the board, you know, in pr pretty much every single state. So it's gonna make it a lot more accessible and easy for people. That's amazing. Yeah. I mean, range is going to be a big issue, right? For, for EVs moving forward and, and where you can yeah. actually charge and how long it's going to take to charge moving forward. Um, so from a, from a gas versus EV mindset, do you see a, a drastically different consumer or do you see a lot of traditional, you know, gas consumers actually just pivoting over into the EV market? 
Yeah, it's it's diversified a lot. What we've seen with ID4 in particular in the last um, few months is there's three audiences. First and foremost, there's the um, what we call the EV established. So those are folks that maybe already in a uh, in a Tesla or they're in some other kind of EV. So they're already ready. They're committed. They're just excited because there's maybe something new and different to add to their garage or switch out. If it's a Tesla, same. Um, <laughs> and the other audience is uh, we call the EV Prime. So ready and excited about EV. There just hasn't been quite the right product for them. This is a big turning point. And then finally, EV Open. So those folks that have said, okay, I'm interested. I'm potentially down the road. I just haven't seen something that fits my needs. Once charging and infrastructure comes online more, I'm definitely more open-minded to that. And that's really the audience that we're starting to actually see sooner than we thought coming into dealerships. Um, we've had some stories from early sales that dealers have said someone came in for um, an SUV or another vehicle that we had, or they came looking for a, a cross shopping a competitor recently. And um, so they were looking for a gas engine car, but they test drove the ID4 and decided to make the change. And so it's okay. really varied across those three audiences, but the ones that we love hearing about in particular are those new ones that said, oh, I'm coming in for this car. And it's like, actually, I'm gonna check out the ID4. And they test drive and they go, oh, it drives like a real car. It seems really fun to drive. They love the instant acceleration. They love the futuristic cockpit that the car has. And they love the fact they can get in a car and say, hello, ID, I'm cold. And the AC, you know, uh, kicks off and then the heater comes back on. So That's just amazing. fun things like that to make it more approachable. Yeah. Connectivity and technology are going to be so important You're in your vehicle interior moving forward. Um, I do want to pivot to just marketing in a broader sense. Um, mm -hmm. You touched on um, this concept of fewer, better, smarter, which I think is such a great approach to, to how we should evolve moving forward. Um, you know, what does the evolution of your go-to-market strategy look like and how much of that was um, brought about by circumstance because of the pandemic? Mm. Well, I would say a couple of things. Definitely a lot of acceleration due to COVID. I think if you have to be um, more targeted, more focused, more flexible with your marketing in general during COVID, it goes without saying that you have to think through more of a journey kind of an approach, right? So where are customers going to be? What are they looking for? How do I be helpful to them? Depending on um, where they're at and what they're interested in. So it's no longer just you have to come to us. We have to obviously come to you. And I think COVID taught us that a lot. But I also think it's just it's time for automotive marketing to change. I'm, I'm very bullish in terms of the playbook that we've had for a long time has been fine. Um, but I think it's about time that we really sit down and, and kind of look at and relook at the landscape and say, you know, there's a lot of great brands out there. There's a lot of great cars out there. There's a lot of people cross shopping our vehicles. It can't just be about the message that we have and think that it's just our brand. It's got to be the whole experience. So if you look at it as what's that journey I would like people to have versus maybe the funnel only approach where I'm getting a lot of people to consider and then fewer and fewer actually cross shop or cross, you know, shop our vehicle and then buy. I kind of joke around, you know, would you rather be in a journey with a brand or would you rather go into a funnel with a brand? And the reality is you probably, well, a journey sounds a lot more fun, right? So how do we as marketers, you know, use this opportunity to accelerate some of that thinking? And then how do we work with partners to say, I don't just want a moment in time on your platform or your channel. I want actually a real journey. And I want you to give me an idea back that helps me look at that customer and give them a fantastic experience from start to finish. So fewer partners uh, planning more um, in a smart fashion and connected together so we don't make a consumer work too hard to um, to do that exploration and that shopping process. Yeah, taking the time to actually reach a consumer when they're ready and willing to engage across any aspect of that journey is so important today. Uh, I mean, it's such a long and complicated process across the board from that awareness to the consideration piece. Um, what are you seeing as like the key the key touch points across that journey? Um, and are you seeing them change and evolve through you know different nameplates, different vehicle sets, different mindsets of consumers? Mm. I mean, I think it, it, again, everything is evolving, right? In the last twelve to eighteen months, I think that um, you know we used to be more about how do I create an experience? Um, maybe it's in broadcast or some sort of video, and that's really like the starting point. That's the trigger for someone to take an action. And obviously now with people spending so much more time in this past several um, you know, months and, and year plus um, in social channels, in digital, 
consuming and streaming, trying all kinds of different ways to keep themselves engaged and connected with others, mm -hmm. that um, that's really changed how their behavior is manifest in terms of looking for a vehicle. So it's not only, again, just how do we make sure we show up in search and social and programmatic, um, third party advertising, all those things that we would have done before, but how do you make sure that um, those things feel like they're more connected together and more of an orchestration not so much, like I said, moments in time. Digital goes without saying can spark, you know, and I would have said before that it would have been something that's more um, broadcast, you know, linear TV, certainly um, video, that's that something, right? And focus all your effort there. And now I tell our agency partners, I'm interested in seeing that content, but I really want to know what's that little moment in time that might spark some interest and how do I make sure that I show up regardless of where people come into that journey and we connect those things back together for them. So. You just, you just don't know. It could be you're driving on a street, you see something. It could be a search ad. It could be somebody commented on something in social. You have to be ready to not only watch those things, but again, connect them back together. And that's really the challenge for us, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It goes back to a lot of that, you know, reach versus relevance conversation. You know, if you want broad reach and you need relevance, it's the balance of, of those two, those two things. Um, you know, talking about the television landscape and kind of tackling that a little bit um, from a linear to connect a TV perspective, um, how are you seeing your strategies evolve now that we're seeing more consumer adoption on streaming platforms and connected TV and a lot of cord cutters um, continuing to cut the cord? Yeah, well, for us, the, trend, the, the evolution, I would say, um, of really focus on a much more broader target with a lot more linear TV to a much more focused target um, and more streaming options, OTT, FEP, connected TV, all those things together, I think have been really helpful for us because, you know, we're a mature industry, right? Automotive um, is under a lot of pressure to, as a category, to figure out how to do marketing more efficiently and more effectively. Yeah. And I don't think anybody's, I would love to say my budget's going to grow, but I think the, uh, unfortunately, you know, we're, we're at a place where we're, like I said, just a, in a mature situation where we have to watch profitability. We have to make sure we're spending every dollar in a really smart and measurable way. Yeah. And doing that with those channels is going to be a lot easier if I have a data layer, if I know what my audience is that I'm targeting. And for us, it's much more in market and near market. So I need to be able to spend the resources where I can measure um, and be more accountable, right, for that, that experience. And then from a connected TV experience, especially, then how do I connect that next experience, knowing that household is potentially in market, so it's not just watching something in one screen, but you know, you've got multiple, and I've also got my phones here, but you've got multiple ways in and those things complement each other. It sounds so basic, but I think that's something that has really had to be accelerated in, in automotive in particular, because we're used to those things being sequential and happening over time. To your point, it's a hard and long uh, decision to make on a vehicle that might cost you yeah. $25,000, $30,000 and, and more. So we need to make sure all those things work together. I talked to my agency about the orchestra and we're like the conductor that should make sure these things are all working together versus you've got your part, you've got your part, you've got your part, and then we'll make the consumer kind of, you know, go through and piece together the music. I think those those days are over, so. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, we at Innovid really focus on two major issues that marketers face um, across the board today, and that's engagement and fragmentation. Um, and really focusing on how do you get someone really pulled into that consumer message, building experiences and not just ads, but then also helping you understand what's happening across the board and really to help bridge the, the silos that we see across media today, um, which is gonna be very important. And then speaking to that, you know, how are you really seeing your teams and your agencies and, and everyone that you're working with currently um, working to bridge those silos? Are we trying to look at things more holistically? Um, should things remain kind of in this disparate state? Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I think actually this is where um, the pandemic and a lot of us working virtually has actually helped us a lot because, you know, we would struggle to get everybody in one room physically all at one time to be able to uh, talk about strategy, brief on a new product launch, get everybody aligned on the same path. You know, with, with virtual meetings and the way that they are now, it's a heck of a lot easier to do that, um, literally. So we're able to bring in a lot more voices a lot earlier in the process and have a lot more iteration of planning. So it's not, you know, one brief and then we go off and we do our own work and our, to your point, our silos. Now it's checkpoints across that, which means we'll get different agency partners, different platforms together in the same space um, virtually more frequently, 
which I think also helps us to not only to be aligned from the beginning, but to stay aligned throughout the process. And I, I'm one of those people, I kind of, maybe it sounds like an overused term, but I don't see silos, I just see people. And so ideas can come from anywhere across the board yeah. at any time in that process. And I think that's where we see a lot more collaboration. I see a lot more ideas coming from places where I don't want you to just give me an advertising idea or just give me a media idea or just give me you know, an experiential idea. They can come from anywhere and you can contribute across the board with anything because we're all consumers. Mm -hmm. We all want the same thing, which is to make it fun and simple and easy mm -hmm. and learn about brands on our terms, not on theirs. And mm -hmm. so I want more voices in the room virtually to help us figure that out. Yeah, that's a that's a definitely a refreshing approach. Um, we we definitely want to focus on you know bringing all these different ideas together, and then being able to have one place where holistically we we can begin to measure what we've done, how it's you know um, reacting in the space, real time validation, understanding how to optimize and build you know new strategy moving forward based on how consumers are actually taking in that that message that we put out to to them as um, consumers. Um, I do want to pivot a little bit to. Um, e-commerce and auto, I think it's become such a um, topic. It's been a topic for a really long time and not a lot has changed in the space. Um, I think the pandemic has brought about some change um, and hopefully maybe um, broader change moving forward, but a lot of consumer expectations have already been really focused on a very seamless journey. You have Gen Z who's grown up with technology you know, in their hands immediately. The expectation there is that the, that digital process is going to be there and it's going to be very easy for me to purchase something um, from my phone, from my desktop, from a digital uh, centric location. Um, how do you see the transformation of e-commerce and auto as a whole and how is Volkswagen really approaching it, especially from an EV perspective, which I think is a very uh, different consumer? Yeah, um, really big question. And I think what I would say is that, you know, um, like everything in the last um, period of time with the pandemic that, you know, we have seen a huge acceleration. Um, I was mentioning Jason earlier, you know, five to 10 years, I think has, has quickly passed in the year's time. So I think um, some industries have done a better job than others. I think we've, um, we've only touched the surface. We've tried to get more of our dealers to embrace digital retailing. Many of them have. It's like anything though, that with any kind of a new, new way of doing things um, for them, that they need more time. I think they need a lot of education, a lot of um, you know, what does this look like when they're used to a consumer coming to them and um, showing them a product in the way that they've used to do that for decades. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we're slowly starting to see that it's not obviously just a digital or virtual experience or brick and mortar, um, which again, for a lot of retail categories, they've done that and they've done that for years. Yeah. I think that now they're seeing this nice blend and really it's about finding out what the customer wants, where mm -hmm. are they in that process, and how can I help them to make a decision um, in whichever way they wish. And it may mm -hmm. end up being, I bring the car to you. We saw a lot of that during COVID, right? It may be, you can come to me in a very COVID safe manner. Let's try to figure out how to minimize your time in the dealership, because we know people are not willing to spend necessarily a lot of time um, in spaces like that. Now that things are opening up again, we're starting to see more people actually look at that experience as, oh, it's a great way to get out <laughs> and to actually spend some time just driving a car. It just feels refreshing and normal again to do that. So a lot of it is just retooling our own minds to how do we listen and learn from a consumer earlier in their path so yeah. we can really understand how to be helpful, both from our standpoint as a brand and then the dealer themselves. So it's acceleration of some of those tools that I mentioned before, that it's also continually to put yourself in the shoes of the consumer and um, figure out how much more helpful we can be with them because technology is only one part of it. Really, mm -hmm. it's just listening, learning. What do you want? A lot of people still want to kick the tires. They still want to test drive a car. It's a big purchase. Yeah. Um, and so we need to be more uh, flexible in that hybrid model. Yeah. It's not just going to be one or the other. I was like, oh no, everyone wants to go virtual. Everyone don't wants to do something in a brick and mortar fashion. I think it's going to be a lot more cross pathing. And I don't think we're quite out of it in terms of understanding what the full impact of, you know, the pandemic has been on our shopping behavior. And more importantly, where do we want to go from here? Yeah. And the true needs of the consumer. You're, you're, you've hit the nail on the head. You know, do you want a full dealership experience? Some people truly still crave that, that, 
touch and feel of going to a dealership and actually being in a vehicle. And some people are willing to, to do the entire purchase process and have a vehicle delivered uh, completely online. Um, so it's, you know, I think it's building that, that seamless path, regardless of, of what the path is that the consumer wants to take. Um, and, you know, obviously we talk about COVID quite a bit because we've been living in this pandemic state for so long. Um, you know, as, as brands and marketers really think about building their brands from all aspects, um, what have you seen that, that you've had to pivot really hard within the pandemic for from, from a brand building perspective? Mm. Well, I mean, again, besides just things like digital retailing and figuring out where to meet the customer at that part of the journey, I think really trying to understand the, the length of time that people want to spend on which parts of that journey have been challenging. And I think we've had to pivot a lot in terms of some of the signals that we would normally sort of see and say, okay, somebody's over here, they're at the beginning. And the reality is they just haven't shopped for a car and maybe they live in New York City. They haven't leased or bought a car in a really super long time. So we, I think, have to had to do a lot better job of trying to read signals and understand when that means somebody's actually truly interested and then what time scale, right? And so how can we make sure that we not only kind of classify things according to the funnel that if you're up here or in TV, more broad land, that means you're just starting versus, you know, digital. And that means you're, you're starting to take more um, active interest in that shopping process. And then ultimately, if you go to a dealer website, does that mean that, okay, now I'm ready to buy? People were sending signals everywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. And I think it's still going to be that way going forward to a certain extent. It's not, like I said, going to be so easy to say, I go from here to here to here. Um, I think now what we have to do is orchestrate things on the back end so that our tiers work more cleverly and smartly together. Mm -hmm. And I think, too, that we have more conversations more regularly about what are consumers' expectations? What do they want? What message is going to be most helpful to them? And then again, how do we connect those dots together? Because we're not there yet, just in full transparency. Yeah. We may have one message, a dealer may have something different, just based off of the way we went to market more than a year ago, right? You know, yeah. we kind of have our roles to play. And now I think consumers are looking at it as one holistic experience, to your point before, and they see other retailers doing that. And uh, we're very much in that category where we have to figure out very quickly how to make it easy and orchestrate something from the very beginning and I think that's where we're still in the learning phase, to be honest, of uh, where we need to show up. I think we're better at, you know, getting the right message to you with more targeted channels, like connected TV is one for sure, mm -hmm. but it's still not a one and done. There's still a lot more pieces to put together for people to make a decision, especially now, just given where we are in the summer coming out of COVID, inventory challenges for automotive and other categories and um, we want to make sure we be we're as helpful as we possibly can be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the consumer journey again, going back to that, is it's so long, and but it can also be really short. It can range from nine days to one hundred and nine days, and and have so many touch points in between. What are you seeing as you know, kind of the biggest outlier um, so far? Is it that? people are willing to have multiple messages um, at the beginning of their journey that are really focused in the end market space and not as a broad awareness piece? Or are you seeing that more people are actually um, still doing that at the end of their journey? Um, what is really standing out to you from that perspective? Hmm. You know, I, I, I think it's, um, it's really both depending on consumers and their mindset right now. So with um, some vehicles very much, I would say it's the, it's the former. I think with EV, it's a little bit more of that plus the latter. So I think it really depends on your time horizon. I think it depends on what you're looking at. Some people that need vehicles right now, it looks very different than those who are shopping for maybe further down the road. We used to say it takes people between six weeks and six months to make a decision. Now, like I said, it's really all over the place. So it's um, reading some of those early signals and making assumptions mm -hmm. is a lot more challenging for us than it was, you know, and it will be, I think, going forward. Um, so again, we have to kind of walk away from our funnel mentality only. Again, I know the funnel has its place. And a lot of people say like, oh, KG, you're so, you know, all about the journey, not about the funnel. The funnel has its place. But when it comes to planning and figuring out what's right for the customer, for the consumer, and where to show up and what it looks like if they don't follow a nice linear path, yeah. if you don't plan that way, I don't know how you end up differently. Meaning, how do you help? the consumer more if your planning doesn't, doesn't look ahead because 
you know, no matter where they are, they may um, see a different message or get a different experience. And if you want it to be holistic and easy, look to look to digitally native brands and direct to consumer brands. And how do they create an ecosystem that's easier, more um, frictionless, you know, and um, something where people just enjoy it? Yeah, that's a great, great point. I think we we've already touched on this idea of creating experiences and not just ads. And I think that's really truly how you can begin to understand what the consumer is looking for, right? Provide a lot of that messaging, not just one at all these different touch points and assuming that they're gonna follow this linear path, but really focusing on the ability for them to choose. Like here's this experience that Volkswagen and these, these other auto brands are providing and seeing where and how they engage, I think will definitely give so much more insight into their path moving forward. Um, so I, I, I do still wanna talk about resetting from COVID and what that looks like. Everyone talks about this new normal um, and what that means and what that begins to mean. I'm starting to hate that that phrase so much. Yeah. What does the new normal even look like? Um, I don't but, know about normal even that word looks like anymore. <laughs> so I don't, and I think it's okay. I mean, I think to the last uh, speaker's points, we have to give ourselves a bit of a break and be much more empathetic even as marketers for our own industry and ourselves that um, normal probably isn't maybe the right way to think about it. Um, it's really more about how, how, how flexible and how helpful do we need to be for our own planning purposes and do we need to be that way for a consumer? So, because if you're kind of looking for, okay, it looked like this before COVID, now it looks like it now, now where are we going and what's that new normal look like? I, I think uh, it's way too early to tell. I think it's going to be a while before we figure out what's the next, uh, you know, we don't, let's not go back <laughs> to the way we were before COVID. let's kind of embrace the best stuff so mm -hmm. maybe there's a way to say you know what was working before in terms of people's enjoyment of products and services the way they interact with brands everything has changed how do you take the best of that for your industry to make sure that um you're evolving and yeah. you've learned from the good and the bad yeah i think the pandemic has definitely forced a lot of marketers to be more agile um, when it comes to not only just their marketing approach overall from a media and a creative perspective, right? Being able to pivot um, as quickly as possible to, to change your messaging, to change your media strategy based on what you're seeing from consumers. Um, do you see a lot of that continuing as, you, as we move forward into what this unknown future looks like in the second half of 2021 yeah. and, and into oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I even tell my team, you know, um, different industries for them to keep their eyes on. I'm constantly amazed by how pretty much every element of our economy has shifted and changed. And when I used to say, you know, a year and a half ago, or a year ago, you know, looking to those digitally native brands and how they're navigating things, because I still think that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. But looking at, um, you know, small mom and pop restaurants um, in your communities and how they're using mm -hmm. QR codes to do menus and, and ordering and payments that um, it sounds so simple and straightforward. But if if it can be done even to celebrate, you know, a moment where you can actually go out and have a meal and enjoy time again with friends and family and you can do it in a way that's so easy to you know get the bill, pay for the bill, et cetera, with, a, with an old school QR code. Mm -hmm. um, then I'm, I'm, I'm excited by that. There can be learning anywhere. In other words, yeah. And what is our, what's the, what's the QR code for automotive that hasn't yet been figured out or discovered. And yeah. So how can we learn from that experience as well as some of the bigger lessons that we've all learned, I think, as a culture. I love that the QR code has become the ultimate comeback king of, <laughs> of COVID. Um, At least it's easier before you'd have to have like a special app on your phone, all that kind of stuff, <laughs> right. To read it. And that was like yeah. a barrier to entry. Now it's just Hover, go, it's done, click, mm -hmm. and then away, you know, one touch. And even my friends are like, oh, what are you doing? I'm like, oh, I just paid for the bill. They're like, well, how'd you do that? Like, Where have you guys been? <laughs> last, last you month, so. code. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, you guys did a wonderful job actually with, with ID4 and positioning QR codes really seamlessly in front of consumers there um, and being able to actually connect what someone is seeing on a TV screen to um, the quick ability to jump on their mobile device and bridging the gap between what normally doesn't, you know, have a bridge there. Um, and then giving a, that secondary experience. And there was an AR experience that you could actually look into ID um, for a little bit. I'd love to hear more about that and, and where that yeah. idea came from. Yeah. I mean, it was literally as, as straightforward of a brief as 
you know, we want to figure out a, a, a true 360 consumer journey around this brand new vehicle that people may not know anything about. They may not know and, and have really experienced an EV, you know, electric vehicle uh, in their own lives, in their own worlds. How do you make it fun and entertaining? So we were able to do that with NBCU across multiple uh, uh, parts of their ecosystem. So it wasn't just here's a moment in time with an ad that you can literally, you know, click on a QR code, bring open experience and have this moment. We wanted to go further. How do you, I literally said to them, I want to bring our vehicle into their living room. I want them to feel yeah. like we're actually literally coming to you and it's all connected together in some way. So, you know, an advertisement and a promotion within the show leads to the talent rather than this case that you might see in that show mm -hmm. where you can then go in the QR code, hover for a second, boom, you're into that experience where she comes into your living room or wherever you're watching a screen and you can interact with and understand and see more of the features and the benefits. Take a little spin, do some fun things. You don't have to get off your couch. You don't have to get off your chair. I mean, it comes to you and, and just to have some fun with it, I think was a really great experience. You can click on there and actually go reserve your ID4. So you can complete yeah. the um, interaction, if you will, and take it further. You can just have some fun with it and learn about the car. So depending on where you're at, at the very least, I want people to see that an EV like that, a brand like Volkswagen, can make something that might seem complicated and a bit confusing, fun, interesting, engaging. And we're not, we don't want to make you work too hard to explore it. It yeah. should just be enjoyable and fun. And, and we have a little um, melody, kind of this chorus thing that we did with Retta dancing around the car. That just added to the fun. So I think it's a, it's a great example of, you know, not just talking about surrounding a consumer in a full 360 view, but how do you make sure those experiences are really connected and it's something that, you know, you, you look ahead to see where they need to be and you have something that's all connected together for them. So there's no, oh, I have to go here to this experience and go over here for that experience. It's all laid out. Yeah. And you really never, like I said, you don't have to leave your, your couch, your chair, wherever you happen to be watching the content, it all comes to you. I mean, that's such a perfect example of bridging all the silos right? You're bringing creative and media and measurement because now you have the ability, you've given yourself this ability to actually track what a consumer is doing from, from your television ad, understanding what that next step that they actually took was and, and how they engaged and um, gave them the ability to reserve a vehicle. Um, I, a question popped up and I think this is an interesting one. You've touched on a little bit of that here and there, um, but Jason wants to know what are the challenges in the EV space to make the decision to buy your first electric vehicle more approachable? Mm, great question. Um, you know, we talked about this earlier that, you know, people's, um, I think, understanding of and perception in terms of that range is spot on. Um, an EV can be the right option for you, depending on literally how do you drive your vehicle? How far do you go? Um, how much access do you have in terms of charging stations? So I say the best thing to do for people is to really get, a, get an understanding of what your daily driving habits are. Right. And what your family needs are, what your individual needs are. So it becomes a lot of the same things that you would look for in a gas engine or a different powertrain. So it's if you're looking for an SUV for utility, cargo, storage space, roominess, all of those features, check. Then figure out for you how much tech do you really want in your car? Right. And then you figure out, well, what does my daily drive look like? Most people don't drive more than about 20, 25 miles each way back and forth to work. And with COVID, people working remotely, that's also changing too. So your driving habits might be different where an EV really makes sense if you've got a 200, 250 mile range plus. It actually fits a lot more needs than we might think. Um, and even on a road trip, you know, map that out and see how far would I be able to go? A lot more charging stations are coming in a lot more markets. So a lot more people are feeling like, yeah, I can make an easy stop along the way and I can charge my vehicle overnight, uh, in the morning, wherever they happen to be. So really making sure that they um, put themselves in their own shoes, which is what does my driving look like now? What do I want it to look like going forward? And there's, it's a really cool thing when you see people drive one of these cars for the first time and go, wow, super quiet, yeah. great acceleration, futuristic. It looks like a real car. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's an SUV. They're impressed with how much stuff goes in the back of the vehicle, everything like that, the roominess, the sun, you know, the uh, sunroof that we've got. And it, it doesn't feel so scary. Yeah. It feels like it's absolutely something they could see themselves in today. Well, you guys took a really fun approach to, you know, 
it was, I think it was the top 10 things of like what you should, what you can do while waiting um, for your vehicle to charge. Um, I think that was, <laughs> that was really fun. It was really cute. And it was, it made it just again, to the, to the questions point, um, it made it more approachable. It made it more human. It made, it gave it yeah. this, the sensibility that I can do that. And um, yeah, you can see a little bit of the pandemic is that not a lot of people are driving really far distances right now. So, so it could be a great opportunity to test it, to see if a, an EV could fit within your lifestyle. Um, yeah, absolutely. So when I, I think, you know, as marketers in general, we, we focus on a lot of these test and learn scenarios and we're constantly iterating and constantly changing and evolving, hopefully, <laughs> um, uh, auto, maybe not as much as, as a lot of other um, verticals, but, you know, as we test and learn, what do, what do you see that you think this is staying and we're moving forward with this? And what, what have you seen, if anything, that is like, we're going to keep this in 2020 or, or yeah. in, in the past? I, I mean, I think it goes without saying that, that testing and learning when you're not quite sure where a consumer is at, you're not quite sure when they're going to be shopping or what, what part of the shopping path they're on. Um, and I think that, you know, how do we, again, read some of those signals differently? I hope those things stay for sure, yeah. because we have to, again, you know, where is, where are you and how can we meet you where you are with what information you need to make a better, more informed, more confident decision. And then how do we fulfill on that from a retail experience a lot more smoothly and effectively? Yeah. I think, again, a lot of that will stay and it should stay. Then it's like, how do we get back to the joy of people wanting to get out a little bit more, shopping mm -hmm. a bit more, spending a bit more time, you know, in our case, kicking the tires and getting behind the wheel of the vehicle. And, and use the best of both worlds. So virtual test driving now becomes, you can do some things virtually, but you may still want to get behind the wheel of a car and actually have someone sitting next to you explaining how things work. Yeah. And so I think some of that will have to um, ebb and flow too and kind of pivot as we go. I just hope that, you know, we become much more of a customer centric, empathetic, flexible community of marketers. And I think we're doing a great job of that. And I'm excited to see more of that come. And I think testing and learning from each other. So outside of our categories, how do I look and see, you know, what other verticals are doing and how are they doing it well? You know, Planet Fitness earlier talking about, you know, how do we get more people to be feeling included in, in physical fitness and in health and wellness? Well, I think that's awesome. We need to, we want to make people feel more included and more part of being part of an EV evolution and a revolution that's coming. And I think that's great. I love it. I think that's, um, it's cool to learn from others. Yeah, um, Katie just um, jumped into the chat here and um, she says very excellent and relevant conversation. Thank you, Kimberly, I 100% agree. Um, how are you engaging in summertime experiential events? Live events have really shifted um, and I yeah. think they need to shift moving forward. Um, how are you guys yeah. about engaging moving forward in, in the summer? Yeah, absolutely. I'm super excited because we've got some fun things planned for July, August timeframe about our new Taos where um, look for things like drive-in kind of movie experiences and places where you wouldn't maybe nice. see them. Um, definitely with music and concerts, we're looking at some hybrid approaches to coming to a few places where you expect to see us show up in terms of experiences around music, but also bring that into people's living rooms, depending on where they are. And then how do we bring that to life in the vehicle from a test type perspective as well? So we're looking at some kind of best of and we're, I think, working with some dealers to try to figure out how do experiences transition coming out of COVID in the summer to get people to dealerships. Because again, people are kind of looking at these retail experiences now as outings. And um, it's like, okay, let's take the family out. We had a family that recently went to a dealership um, in the Northeast and one of them was interested in the vehicle. They all came out buying Volkswagens. Wow. So um, it, it, it was literally a family affair. And I think we sold a couple of chalices and a cross sport and another vehicle. I'm like, wow, I don't think I've ever heard that happen before. That's amazing. They, it, you know, what a fun way to spend your time. And uh, they all came away with, like I said, with Volkswagen. So I, I'm excited about getting out and about again. And it's so great for automotive because to experience a car in person, it's, uh, it's second to none. So I agree 100%. Um, another question just popped in here. Um, and we're gonna need you to pull out your crystal ball out for this one. Um, oh. When everything is back to normal, um, how will um, the automotive industry have changed permanently in your perspective? Mm, gosh, well, I think we touched on it a little bit before that, um, you know, it's, I think a, 
digitally enabled, a digitally informed experience and in some way, shape or form is here to stay. Mm -hmm. I think more of a targeted experience where it really feels like, you know, we've been a bit leg, we've been a bit um, behind the curve in terms of how do we really personalize the experience for people um, and meaning shopping, exploration, you know, buying, et cetera. I think those things will um, evolve for sure. And I think too, you'll see again, a lot more folks in the future, I think really revisiting what transportation means for them. And I think that could mean new ways of thinking about cars. Um, and I don't, I don't even know what that means just yet, but I'm kind of hypothesizing around, yeah. you know, if, um, if people really value their cars in new ways, how do we make a vehicle in of itself a destination versus just being able to get you from a destination to another destination? So yeah. more entertaining within the actual car itself and some new ways to think about cars as a space. Such a great point. I love that that thought and that concept of, of building. How do we build something that surrounds a consumer instead of something that just takes you from point A to point B. It's a true experience when you get into your vehicle. Um, that would be interesting moving forward. Um, another uh, question um, from Mike is, how is your approach to campaign measurement evolving based on recent changes in privacy and the loss of things like digital identifiers? Mm, yeah, love a question. <laughs> That's a tough one. Um, I, you know, and again, I think we're we're um, still in the infancy in terms of how do we really pull together uh, first party data? How do we leverage first party data the way we should? I will be uh, transparent and say that we're doing an okay job, but we're, we have a lot more to go. Um, we're trying to figure out now as simple as it sounds, but how do we create more opt in content across mm -hmm. our ecosystem? So we're used to here's our message, here's who we want to talk to, we put it in front of you. I think now we're trying to figure out much more, how do we create more of that journey and that relationship with the consumer? And so how can we invite you in more for content that might be more helpful to you versus just talking about spec and features and functions and benefits and things like that mm -hmm. from the get-go. So we're trying to figure that out right now is opt-in, more data that you opt in for, more information and more of an experience that you opt in for that you're looking forward to that next uh, communication. Um, not necessarily all coming from either advertising or CRM or other channels, but a holistic kind of spectrum. So um, way more to come on that one. Yeah, I think that's such a fair point. You have to you have to start to understand the space a little bit better and, and what you can and can't provide to a consumer from a personalization perspective um, as you evolve um, your measurement strategy as a whole. Um, another interesting question came up is, how do you see your audience demographic expanding to be more inclusive as the industry mm -hmm. grows and evolves? Yeah, well, and as the car buying, I think population changes as well. You know, older buyers, younger buyers coming into the marketplace. Again, people that may not have bought a car um, before, you know, pandemic now have done that, or now they're trying to figure out where am I living? Do I, am I in an urban center where I've got public transportation like New York City, or do I not want to go back to that necessarily and move someplace else? So I think there's a lot of those question marks out there for um, people to, to figure out. So it's, it's, a, it's a tough one. And I think we're going to see a lot more uh, reappraisal, I guess, um, is how I would just you know, think about it. And we need to do a lot better job of meeting you where you are. And you know, it's, it's not going to, you know, we had this conversation in planning meeting this morning internally. It's, it's going to look a lot different. There is really no normal necessarily. I think there's just a, what did we really learn from this experience and how do we make sure that we don't just assume as a one buyer set, another buyer set, another buyer set that we've covered the market. Yeah. You know, things need to be approachable for everyone to that, to the yeah. question about how do you be more inclusive? Yeah. Things should be easier to understand. And you should feel person. you should feel like there's a personal interaction. It's 100%. not just, oh, click here for this message, but oh, we see you've got kids and here's something that might be helpful to you as you think about what the next vehicle is that's going to be right for you. Mm -hmm. How do we make everyone feel welcome? Yeah. Simple language, easy to understand um, shopping process, things mm -hmm. that are engaging and interesting and don't feel like I have to spend a lot of time to learn about something that feels like it's for someone else. Yeah. Not for me. And don't, not maybe so much car speak, dare I say it, and the way that we've talked about cars before. Because yeah, for some buyer sets, even um, not only just for, for women, but younger buyers, it feel like that kind of feels like it's for the car guys over there, not necessarily yeah. for me. We, we need to be mindful of that, I think, a lot more so. so um, mm -hmm. And make things even easier for more mature buyers. Or like, there's a lot of tech in this car. 
somebody needs to explain this to me because yeah. um, it's a lot different maybe than the car they had five years ago. So how do you break it down? Be very empathetic. Um, and uh, I think that will help us a lot to navigate some of those um, questions about inclusivity and just making things easier to understand and more approachable. Yeah. When you start with that consumer mindset in mind with your marketing, I think you, you're, you hit the nail on the head that that empathy goes a long way um, when you're putting those, that messaging out and that strategy. Um, a great question came up too. Uh, what can heritage brands learn from newer digital first brands when it comes to authentically marketing to Gen Z? Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, no, I, 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 this is like an interview question I love asking, which is what are you really good at? Yeah. Right. Um, and what can I help you work on? Yeah. And I think if we were to, to talk to each other as if brands are talking to each other, if you will, as people, yeah. then I know, well, I'm really good at this and I'm not so great at that. And we're transitioning as, a, as an industry, as a culture to figure out how do I take some of these legacy ways of doing business and, and flipping them on its head where digitally native brands, direct to consumer brands, that's what they do because that's where they started from. So how can they help you figure out what the right thing is? Not the right thing, but what a better way to do things are. Yeah. And the more I also say too, the more complicated something gets, that just means you got to work harder to, to break it down and make it simple. You know, it's, it's, uh, people need to make, want to make, I think, informed, confident, good decisions yeah. about everything. And so yeah. how can we learn from those to do that best and make it simple for people to do that um, across the entire ecosystem? So. It's yeah. exciting because I hope we learn from each other in some new ways. Yeah, and taking that empathy, but adding transparency to that too, right? Because you mm -hmm. want to understand what's, what, what's behind that brand and, and even the importance of those brand values um, as you differentiate your, your own brand in the space. Um, if you, <laughs> This is a great one. If you could give your younger self a piece of career advice, Kimberly, what would that piece of advice be? Career advice? Yeah. <laughs> Just um, one piece. <laughs> one piece. Um, gosh, it's okay not to have all the answers. Yeah. Right. So I, I start off my, oh, I'm going to do this. You know, this is like my five year plan, my 10 year plan. Where am I going? How am I going to build it? Where do I need to go to school? How do I need to move up the ladder? All that. I thought I had to know it all. Surround yourself with people that can help at each step of that journey with you because try to figure out what's going to make you happy for the next couple of years might be hard enough. Don't try to don't try to answer questions that aren't yet there years and years down the road and surround yourself with really great people that really care about you you know professionally and personally so that you don't feel like you're alone in whatever part of your journey you are in chances are there's a lot of people around you that have gone through something similar and they're ready and willing to you know give you advice and help you out along the way so don't go it alone don't try to figure it out all by yourself and give yourself a break Awesome. That actually sounds like great advice right now too, for everybody yeah. as everyone deals with this, this, you know, ability to, to balance work life and your personal mm -hmm. life. Um, you know, how have you found a way to keep your work and home life separate and have you actually separated it or has this become this, this new <laughs> blend of yeah. what your personal life has become with work? Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of an unusual circumstance. So I've never thought about work as work. Um, I've been lucky enough to do what I love, like for a super long time. Mm -hmm. And so when my daughter, she's 18 now, she's watched my career happen over many years. And she's like, mom, you're always working. I'm like, no, I don't think about it that way. It's I'm always learning. I'm engaging. I'm trying to solve problems. My nightstand is filled with books that are psychology and empathy and financial decisions, all kinds of stuff. So that's what fuels me and it keeps yeah. me engaged. And I love what I do. So. I love that. You're teaching, teaching your daughter and the next generation so many amazing things growing yeah. up. Yeah. But that said, have a work life balance. Like <laughs> it may look like this, but you don't have to be like mom. So yeah. I also tell her that like, it's okay. You don't have to, you know, love your work and live your work the way I do. Do what works for you. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's wonderful. Hi, Jason. Hey, how you guys doing? Wow. That was great. Thank you so much. And I, I apologize for a little bit of the production uh uh mishap at the beginning but uh sure. and we got that clarified and this was a great conversation kimberly you're always so gracious with your time and your thought leadership for the brand innovators community we really appreciate all that you always give and thank you odd for for